All right, happy Sabbath. Sabbath. Good to be back here, getting in the Word again. Um, Obviously, we've been going through this series, Understanding the Bible, for over a year now. Um, Getting in, trying to get a 30,000-foot view, sometimes a 20,000, sometimes a 10,000, sometimes pretty close up. Um, But overall thrust is to get get the overall thrust of what the Word's talking about. we just wrapped up uh, the prophet Jeremiah and are now in a short book called Lamentations. Uh, Lamentations is generally uh, perceived to be another book uh, by the prophet Jeremiah. Um, it is <clears throat> circa 586 BC, maybe shortly thereafter, because um, it's a lamentation, or actually five lamentations, over the desolation of Jerusalem, over them being punished for their sins and being put out of God's house. Uh, in short, it's a it's a weeping over Jerusalem. Um, <clears throat> so, as we've come through the story, uh, uh, we've seen all the way back in the Torah of Moses, that there was a recognized time. God, who exists outside of time, knows the end from the beginning, knew what was going to be happening with Israel, knew uh, and prophesied through Moses. He said, you know, after my death, you're going to all fall away. You're going to be doing these things. And, um, you know, you're going to choose for yourself a king, all these various things that they did. And he said, uh, God spoke through Moses, through uh, Leviticus and Deuteronomy and the blessings and cursings chapters that what would come upon them um, for their disobedience, uh, they would receive curses. Um, And as we've seen uh, through Isaiah and um, back in the books of the Kings, we see this destruction that was pronounced in this desolation, in this removal, um, come to fruition. You know, like 2 Kings, we're going to briefly look at that. Um, And then definitely in Isaiah and Jeremiah. Jeremiah is really exciting because it's pivotal um, in in the matters of the covenant here where he's, because we do see pronounced there in Jeremiah 31, this, time again that was pronounced by Moses there's going to be a prophet like on the Moses who's going to be uh, one who stands there in the breach and who was the uh, the, the daysman between man and God and the group and bringing in a, a new covenant and we see that come right here into play in the time when Judah is cut off and said get out the house because you played the harlot. And so uh, we're still hearing that same theme here in the book of Lamentations. Uh, Like I said, it's five laments. Uh, Laments are basically, they're crying out. Um, Crying out in despair or uh, desperation or crying out over these things. It's not necessarily an an ungodly thing to do. Lamentation is a thing that happens within the prophets. Jeremiah lamented over the destruction of his people and the loss of life and all these things that occurred. Lamenting is not in love itself a bad thing. Jesus himself wept, you know. Um, But how are you lamenting? Are you lamenting like the people of the Lord or lamenting like people of the world. Um, So something you'll notice here, um, you notice a common theme in these laments as far as their lengths. Notice that they're all parts of 22. And that's not this because we decided to make book and chapter verse that way. It's based on the actual Hebrew. Um, the first four of the laments 
are acrostics. Okay, so I'll, I'll give you an example here in the Hebrew. This is the first lament. If you notice there on the right, at one next to one one, the first letter is an aleph. Verse two, it's a bait. Verse three, it's a gimel. Verse four, it's a dalet, because every verse begins with the next succeeding letter in the Hebrew. Aleph, bait, gimel, dalet, you know, going on down. And that's the way um, lament one and lament two and lament four are. Lament three, you notice, was 66 verses, because it's three verses of aleph, three verses of bait, three verses, um, whereas the fifth lament is not an acrostic, but it is 22 verses in the Hebrew. 22 is the number of letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Right? So these they um, these are often applied throughout the scriptures. We find them in the Psalms. It's a, it's a great memory device to help remember. You know, you, you know oh, the next one begins with a bait. The next one begins with a gimel. And it helps you to memorize um, these. Um, there are three main voices that we hear throughout uh, these laments. Uh, and that's the voice of the narrator, the author. Uh, the voice of Zion, which is a Jerusalem personified. Uh, we'll definitely see that there in the latter half of uh, Lament 1. And then uh, the remnant of Zion, uh, especially there in the fifth lament, um, crying about uh, their place and what's going on and the tragedies that have occurred. Uh, there, there are uh, various key verses. I, I, uh, these two are, to me, are, are the most key of the key. Uh, Lamentations 2, 17. <clears throat> the Lord has done that which he has devised. He has fulfilled his word that he commanded in the days of old. He has thrown down and has not pitied. He has caused your enemy to rejoice over you. He has set up the horn of your adversaries. And... This is, again, this is a, a big thing we saw through the prophet Jeremiah over and over again. And again, back in, in Isaiah, pronouncing what's going to be coming. There's going to be a king coming from the north. There's going to be this hard one that comes in. Again, back in Deuteronomy, there's going to be a man whose language you know not, and he's going to come in. He's going to be a man of fierce kind. All this stuff has been prophesied. It's words commanded in the days of old of what was going to happen when they're disobedient to the covenant. Uh, and that he has set up the horn of your adversaries. He says this, you know, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, my servant, whom I've called. And so he called him in to come in and rain down these tragedies upon the people, which is repercussions for what they sowed. This is what they read. Um, Lamentations 3, 21 to 23. Um, this I recall to my mind. Therefore, have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Yes, should make a song out of that. Yeah. So there's a reason uh, Ron chose that song. This here this morning, or this afternoon, uh, is for the sake of uh, the connection here with the Book of Lamentations. This is... I would say of, of these here, but these two are key to me for a couple of things because uh, they both talk about God's faithfulness. God is faithful to what he says is going to happen, whether it's good or evil. He's promised blessing. He's promised cursing. He's faithful to both. Um, and uh, that's rock. You, could, you can stand on that knowing this is who he is. There's no shadow or variable, variableness of turning within him. Um, but he is faithful. And his compassion is never ending, never failing. Right? So these two are key, again, back to the same thing we were talking about during Tabernacles, that God is good. Right? All the time. And all the time, God is good. And 
recognizing that is key, um, especially in a time like this, a time of lamenting, a time here in the book of Lamentations. Think about this, this is written here, they just entered into captivity, all they knew, their whole life, pulled out. And now they're here in the land of the enemy. These are key to keeping you stayed on the rock during such times because this isn't just talking about them, right? <clears throat> so again, here's the background for the book, uh, Second Kings 25, 8 to 12, some other examples of this. Like I said, this is, again, the same theme is right there in the book of Jeremiah. In the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, which is the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, he came, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he was a captain of the guard. He came, he was the servant of the king of Babylon. He came to Jerusalem and he burnt the house of the Lord and the king's palace and all the houses of Jerusalem and every great man's house burnt he with fire and all the army of the Chaldees that were with the captain of the guard they broke down the walls of Jerusalem round about now the rest of the people that were left in the city the fugitives that fell away the king of Babylon with all the remnant of the multitude did Nebuzaradan the king of the guard carry away but the captain of the guard left the port of land to be vine dressers and husbandmen to keep keep tilling the land under my under our command we're going to leave the refuse there who aren't wise enough strong enough or uh able mind enough to stand against us like the people did who we carried away or slew all right so this is the background this is uh what's led to lamentations lamentations again there's five of them essentially essentially we got number one is lament over jerusalem's desolation Two, uh, God set Jerusalem under a cloud. Three, I am a man who has seen affliction. Four, how the gold has become dim. And five, Lord, hear our, hear our plea. Uh, this essentially, I, I, the, uh, these titles I grabbed from the, basically the first set of words of each, just like the way the books of the Bible are named. Uh, there's the general overall theme of these things. Uh, coming on through. Um, some points in here. So how does how does a city sit solitary that was full of people? She's become as a widow. She that was great among the nations and princes am uh, amongst the provinces, how she's become a tributary. All right. So he, he begins talking about how great, how blessed they were, how glorious they were, and how they have fallen from that. She who had kings and princes are now bring in tribute to other kings and princes. Um, and he compares her to like a widow. He compares Zion, the city. And so in speaking about her, how she sits solitary. She was full of people. Now Jerusalem is desolate. There is a desolation of Jerusalem. Um, it continues on down there. Just want to hit a, a, a few things in here. Um, he said, Jerusalem grievously sinned. She has removed all that honor her, despise her, because they have seen her nakedness. Yea, she sighed and turned backward. Her filthiness is her, in her skirts. She remember not her last end. Therefore, she came down wonderfully. She had no comforter. This is right before the first set of red there. It says, O Lord, behold my affliction, for my enemy has magnified himself. Um, he's saying, look, you know, Jerusalem, when she was living large in her blessedness, was off playing the harlot. All these people that she thought liked her or cared about her, they were just using her. Of course, she was a harlot. And those who honor her now despise her. And they are done. They've had their they got their gain, and they're done. But he's saying in here, O oh Lord, behold my affliction. And again, towards the end there, see, O oh Lord, and consider, for I am become vile. So 
saying, look at, look what's happened. What, uh, look what's happening. What are you going to do about this? What are you, look at this, God. Where is our God? It's a cry we see throughout the Lamentations here. We've seen it not throughout the prophets, uh, also through the prophets, through Jeremiah, through Isaiah, the, through the Psalms. People are saying, where are you? Why, why aren't you helping us? Why aren't you helping us? All this time when God's there, talking to them, providing for them, calling them to repent, and God's there, but they're not saying, where's God now? They're not asking then, but when God steps back, puts them out, now they're saying, where's our God? Where's our God? Why is he helping us? That's often something that people say in times of tragedy. You know, people here in America, where was God on 9-11? Where was God with, you know, these various school shooting uh but are they asking from a proper perspective what we should be doing is seeking to understand what god is doing because oftentimes where is our god becomes a judgment against god Why would you allow this to happen to me? Why would you allow this to happen to fill in the blank? It becomes a judgment against God instead of saying and trying and trying to understand through the eyes of eternity in the overall picture that he sees, what is he doing? All right. Uh, one of the things I've shared on social media um, Oh, several times over the years, uh, is a line like, why is this happening to me? And then with a line through it and saying, what is this teaching me? Um, it's better for us to understand what is this teaching me than why is this happening? Why is this happening can be part of the teaching. Like, it would be a great question from them to say, instead of saying, where's our God? They're saying, why does this happen to us? Well, let's understand why this happens to you um, and realize you're reaping the consequences of your actions. And that should then help you to not lay a charge at God's feet, but to also understand what God's doing through these circumstances, through, through um, tragedies or such. Um, so in, the, in these um, last 13 verses of chapter 1, uh, this is... Here, Zion, this is, you know, personified. You know, is it nothing to you, all that pass by? Behold and see if there's any sorrow like unto my sorrow, what's done to me, wherewith the Lord has afflicted me in the day of his fierce anger. And so here's Zion crying out about, look at, look at what's happened to me. And we see down here in the red, uh, right, you know, Jerusalem's a, like a, a menstruous woman amongst them. The Lord is righteous. For I have rebelled against his commandment. Here I pray you, all people, behold my sorrow. My virgin, uh, virgins and young men are go gone in the captivity. I have called for my lovers, but they deceived me. My priest and my elders gave up the ghosts in the city while they sought their food to relieve their souls. Behold, O Lord, I am in distress. My bowels are troubled. My heart is turned within me, for I have grievously rebelled Abroad the sword bereaves, at home there is death. So here he's saying, the Lord is righteous in what's happening here. This is happening to me. I am bereaved of people. I am left desolate because I have rebelled against his commandments. And then he says, here, I pray you, all people, behold my sorrow. Here Zion is crying out, learn from my mistake. Look at what I did. Look at the consequences of what I did and learn from it. Hear this. Look what's happened. My virgins and young men, they're gone to the captivity. The people I entered into bogus things with, my lovers, they deceived me. 
people I thought were going to be my help and save me from these things that the righteous prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah were said were coming. These, again, are great warnings for us, life application. I mean, I want us to understand, first of all, the, the, his, historic, the historicity of this, but also understand it in life application. Right? Yes. So, it's important that we recognize um, and confess our sin and instead of trying to tape over it, you know, like, remember uh, years back, there was times like with an idiot light on a dashboard, and sometimes my dad would take black tape and put it over the, the idiot light because he didn't want to see it no more. That doesn't make the problem go away. Closing your eyes to your sin doesn't remove the sin. Um, there's idiot lights on a dashboard for a reason, and we'll have idiot lights in life telling us there's an issue. We need to not be an idiot and not mask over them. Right. <clears throat> uh, the second lament is uh, God set a Jerusalem under a cloud. Um, and that, by the way, is not a good thing. All right. Uh, as he begins here, how has the Lord covered the daughter of Zion with a cloud in his anger and cast down from heaven unto the earth the beauty of Israel? So it's like the description of her is it's like the description we read about Satan, right? He's cast, cast the beauty of Israel down from heaven down to earth. And he says he remembered not his footstool in the day of his anger. Here be in Jerusalem. All right. Um, so this lamentation is a lot about the the anger of the Lord to his people, to Zion, to Jerusalem. And uh, we'll come down, let's just jump into the red. He says, He has swallowed up Israel, he has swallowed up all her palaces. He has destroyed his strongholds. He has increased in the daughter of Judah mourning and lamentation. He has violently taken away his tabernacle as if it were a garden. He has destroyed his places of the assembly. The Lord has caused the solemn feast and the Sabbath to be forgotten in Zion and has despised in the indignation of his anger the king and the priest. The Lord has cast off his altar. He has a abhorred his sanctuary. He has given up into the hand of the enemy the walls of her palaces. And so all of these things he's talking about that God has done here. He says, they made a noise in the house of the Lord. It's in the day of the solemn feast. They were crying out. Remember like when we read that in like Ezra and it says they couldn't tell if the distinguished people were crying or joyous. He's like, you know, they get, there was this crying out that was happening. The Lord has purposed to destroy the wall of the daughter of Zion. He has stretched out a line. He has not withdrawn his hand from destroying. Therefore, he has made the rampart and the wall to lament. They languish together. Her gates are sunk into the ground. He has destroyed and broken her bars. Her king and her princes are among the Gentiles. The law. The, he says, no more. He says, the Torah, the lo Torah, and her prophets also find no vision from the Lord. People have lost these things that were given to them as an understanding and a provision from God. And he says, the law and the prophets I gave you, I'm taking them from you because what you've done are wrong. And uh, as an aside here, I want to say, uh, in here where it says, destroy the places of assembly, the Lord has caused the solemn feast and the Sabbath to be forgotten in Zion. I uh, just want a little side note here. I've, heard this used by, say, like lunar Sabbatarians or some other people with bizarre calendars to say, oh, look, they forgot the Sabbath. They forgot these things. No, it's caused Zion to forget these things because this is where they went to observe the festivals. That's why they're no more remembered there because no one is there. It is left desolate. It isn't the people forgot the feast. They, don't, they didn't forget when they were. They didn't forget how the calendar operated. They didn't forget what date was the Sabbath but they were remembered no more in Zion because no one was coming there because they were in captivity. Mm. 
But again, one of the things that we saw is like even even in these times we read like through Isaiah and through Jeremiah, where he's the, the prophets are chastising them because they're having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. They're still coming to the temple. They're still bringing <laughs> offerings. They're still praying. They're still keeping Sabbath and new moons and festivals. And God's like, I, I, I can't away with this. What are you doing? This because you're having this religion. You have some form of keeping the Torah. You think you're acceptable in my sight. He says, that ain't the case. And so there's a good warning in here in what he's saying. Because remember that back in Jeremiah, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. Right? They, were, they put their trust in the temple. Enemy can't come in. This is God's house. God's here. God ain't going to let him take over his house. They put their trust in things and in laws and didn't have their trust in the relationship with God through the covenant. Right? <clears throat> I ran across this um, uh, from the Compact Survey of the Bible. It says, sometimes God removes the signs of his grace so that our faith and our longing may be rooted in him and not in the symbols of his presence. And so, in this case, signs of his grace. He gave them a tabernacle as a means so that they can maintain a relationship. He gave them the temple as the means they can maintain a relationship. He gave them a priesthood and laws of offerings as a means that they can have grace and not be removed from his presence. But when they didn't comprehend that means of grace and this said, how I can just loosely hold on to these things and not really do these things in my heart, he had to remove those things from him to realize he is the place they need to be attached to, not the things. Our faith in longing has to be rooted in him, not in the symbols of his presence. <clears throat> Chapter 2. Uh, continue here in uh, verses 13 to 17. He says, come down here into the red, your prophets have seen vain and foolish things for you, and they have not discovered your iniquity to turn away your captivity, but have seen for you false burdens and causes of banishment. Who are the prophets in your life? Who are you relying on in your life to correct you and draw you closer to God? Are they false prophets? Are they steering, steering you away elsewhere? Are they like these prophets of old who wouldn't help the people to understand their sin? They wouldn't help them to understand, hey, this is happening because of what you did. Oh, no, no, it's this person's fault, or it's that person's fault, or it's this, or it's that. Oh, it's that wicked prophet Jeremiah. It's his fault. Don't. It says, if you would have discovered your iniquity, you could have had your captivity turned away. No, they tell you, oh, it's for this cause. This is why you're being banished. It was a lie then, it is a lie today. Who are you choosing to be around? to give you guidance as the prophets of old were to the people. <clears throat> in uh, the last section there in the red, the Lord has done that which he had devised. He has fulfilled his word, that which he commanded in the days of old. He has thrown down, he has not pitied. He has caused your enemy to rejoice over you. He has set up the horn of your adversaries. This is one of the key verses I mentioned at the start. And again, it's good to know that God is good and He is faithful to His Word, even if His Word is a, root, a word of pronouncement of judgment against any one of us, because all of us are liable before God, because there's none good, no, not one. All have fallen short of the glory of God. And we need to keep that in the front and center of our mind lest we start boasting in ourselves or thinking, I don't deserve this. Why is this happening? Why is this happening to me? I don't, I don't, I'm a good person. Right? 
So again, God fulfilled his word. These, his words have been prophesied from near the beginning, from the time when the tribes were first saved from enslavement in Egypt. He's been saying, here's what's going to happen. And he is faithful to it. And it's happened. Mm -hmm. Chapter 3. Uh, I am the man who has seen affliction. So here, this again, these lamentations are coming from an eyewitness of these days, which, again, Jeremiah fits that bill. He was right there at the time when these things uh, befell the nation of Israel. Uh, I'll pick it up in uh, like 13 to 32 in here in this section. He has caused the arrows of his quiver to enter into my reins. Saying, God's, God is he's shooting me. He's afflicted me taking me out with his arrows, and he's allowed to enter into the reins. That, that's like, his, he's hitting me in the heart. That's the, the reins, my, he's hitting me in, in my heart and my mind. I was a derision to all my people and their song all the day. He has filled me with bitterness. He has made me drunken with wormwood. He has also broken my teeth with gravel stones. He has covered me with ashes. You have removed my soul far off from peace. I forgot prosperity. All right? Affliction comes on, tragedy comes on, and this ha what does it happen in your life? What is your response to tragedy? What is your response to these winds and waves in life or afflictions that happen? All right? Because he says, I'm at a point. Look, <laughs> I'm covered with ashes. My my soul's removed from peace. I, I find no peace. Uh, forget about prosperity. It, it ain't happening. Right? But then he said, I said, my strength and my hope is perished from the Lord. Oh, but what? Remembering my affliction and my misery, the wormwood and the gall, my soul had them still in remembrance and is humbled in me. I'm remembering all this affliction that's happened to me. It has humbled me. All right? Remember, like the Apostle Paul, the things that he had... He he did, and he says, "I don't deserve to be I don't deserve to be apostle. I don't deserve to be alive because of the things I did. Persecuting the Lord and the church and killing people. So it humbled him. He remembered it, and it brought him to humility. And and so uh, the author here is saying, I'm remembering this affliction, this misery, these things that happened. My soul keeps in remembrance, and it is humbled in me. My soul is humbled in me." knowing these things. This I recall to my mind, and therefore I have hope that it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because His compassions fail not. So This could have been a whole lot worse. We deserve to be wiped off the map. How long did we as a people push it before He came in and took us out the house? Because it didn't like they were like a glorious people from the time he set them up. Or not even the glorious people in the days of Solomon. Hence the kingdom was split in two. We've been seeing <coughs> issues with them from the moment they were taken in the wilderness. Right? But through the whole time we see God's mercies are there, and therefore we are not consumed, he says. Likewise for us. Right? Because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him. To the soul that is seeking him, it is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bears the yoke in his youth. He sits alone and keeps silence because he has borne it upon him. He puts his mouth in the dust that there, so be, that there may be hope. He gives his cheek to him that smites him. He is filled full of reproach. The Lord will not cast off forever. Though he causes grief, yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. So again, this, this thrust here in this third lament is saying, <laughs> we have fallen short in these things that we are experiencing now are things that we deserved 
and I'll remember that, and it'll humble me. And I know, in spite of what we've done, that God is faithful, and God will still have mercy on us, and we just have to patiently endure. A man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Here we are. Man, we've had, we're homeless. We were kicked out of our house and sent to go live with enemies. But while we're here, now that we can finally see, now that we're not thinking we're something we're not, we can see and recognize his mercy in, even in this and know that he has said he has another better end for us. And he's faithful to his word. So now we have to patiently endure through these afflictions. All right? Uh, towards the, the two-thirds into the lament, he says, Wherefore does a living man complain? This is verse 39 to 41. A man for the punishment of his sins. Let us search and try our ways and turn again to the Lord. Let us lift up our heart with our hands unto God in the heavens. Again, this is, this is key. I, I want us to understand this here again in a living way. That when there is thought to complain about things happening in your life, to recognize, I'm not saying all tragedy, all affliction is sin-based. But it's good glasses to put on for yourself in a look in the mirror. This is more of a, of a self thing it's too easy when you see someone afflicted to say oh you must have sinned you know like job's friends that's job's place to grab the mirror right and it's a good mirror to grab a hold of and look at why is this happening to me what is this teaching me the right why is this happening right uh that then we search and try our ways and turn again to the lord know that god is faithful Chapter 4, how has the gold become dim? Um, again, this is, each of these titles are from uh, essentially the first line in each of the laments. How has the gold become dim? How has the most fine gold changed? The stones of the sanctuary are poured out in the top of every street. The precious sons of Zion, comparable to fine gold, how they are esteemed as earthen pitchers, the works of the hand of potter. Saying, look, man, the splendor that used to be here Israel was gold that shined before the world. How precious it was, and now how dim it has become. The stones of the sanctuary are poured out. Right? The house is brought down. And he says, and then the sons of Zion, they were like fine gold, but now people think of them like a, like a, jar, like a clay jar. They're no longer golden. Verse 5 and 6, they that did feed delicately are desolate in the streets. They that were brought up in scarlet now embrace dung hills. For the punishment of the iniquity of the daughter of my people is greater than the punishment of the sin of Sodom that was overthrown in as a moment and no hand stayed on her. Saying, we were living large. God was taking care of us. We were having, we were having delicacies. Now we're grabbing on the dung hills to find something to eat. People who were brought up in scarlet, fine clothes, now where are we at? At the dung hills. And these things are happening here. This, this is worse than that. Sodom got hit once, overthrown in a moment. And these things now we're enduring. Right? Verse 10 to 13, the hands of the pitiful woman have sodden their own children. And I'm including this here. This is exactly what was said was going to be happening back in Moses, throughout the prophecy. Things were said they were eating their own children. How tragic was the things that befell Israel, Judah, here in the day. They were food and the destruction of the daughter of my people. The Lord has accomplished his fury. He has poured out, poured out his fierce anger and has kindled a fire in Zion and has devoured the foundations thereof. 
The kings of the earth and all the heavens of the world would not have believed that the adversary and the enemy should have entered into the gates of Jerusalem. It's the same way Israel felt. Oh, we're safe here. It's Jerusalem. This is the Lord's place. The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. But for the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priests that have shed the blood of the just in the midst of her. What's going on? This is the same thing Jesus pronounced in Matthew 23. All the blood is found in you. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets. Verse 21, 22, Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom, that dwells in the land of Uz. The cup shall also pass unto you, and you will be drunken and shall make yourself naked. The punishment of your iniquities accomplished, O daughter of Zion. He will no more carry you away into captivity. He will visit your iniquity, O daughter of Edom. He will discover your sins. Remember, we saw this. There at the end of Jeremiah, where he was giving his woes to the nations, including Edom, and what was going to happen, he, he, was, he had Jeremiah bring the cup to the various nations. Here it is in Lamentations. Oh, Edomites, you, guess what? This, you're going to stand there and, and mock the same nakedness is going to occur to you, the same drunkenness is going to occur to you, and the same judgment is going to come upon you. Notice in here the hope that's, that's stated. Again, and through all these things that we're, we keep seeing this glimmer of hope in here, he says, the punishment of your iniquity is accomplished. O daughter of Zion, he will no more carry you away into captivity. So again, talking about the redemption of the remnant, bringing them back, O daughter of Zion. And then the fifth lament, uh, Lord, hear our plea. Just the general thrust of what the, this is about. Uh, remember, O Lord, what has come upon us. Consider and behold our reproach. Our inheritance is turned to strangers, our houses to aliens. We are orphans and fatherless. Our mothers are as widows. We have drunk on our water for money. Our wood is sold to us. Our necks are under persecution. We labor and we have no rest. We have given the hand to the Egyptians, to the Assyrians, to be satisfied with bread. Our fathers have sinned and are not. Our fathers sinned and are dead. We have borne their iniquities. The servants have ruled over us. There is none that deliver us out of their hands. We got our bread with the peril of our lives because of the sword of the wilderness. Now again, we should know this. I, I want to make this clear here. He ain't saying, hey, we didn't sin. It was our dad's fault and we're being punished for it. That's not the context of what's being said. Right, And I, I understand you could think that's the case, but that's not how God operates. It's the soul that sins, it shall die. And as a nation, they were in wickedness. Their final king at the time was a wicked king when they were taken away. But he's saying, look what's happened. We're, <laughs> what we had, this inheritance we had, has been given over to strangers. There are some of us left there, but now... We have to buy water, our own water that you gave us. We got to pay for it. Our own trees, we got to pay for that wood. That's ours. It's been taken from us and given to a stranger. How bad things have become. So he's pleading. The, the, the remnant here is pleading to God. Uh, 15 to 22 here. The joy of our heart is ceased. Our dance is turned in the morning. The crown has fallen from our head. Woe unto us that we have sinned. For this our heart is faint. For these things our eyes are dim. Because of the mountain of Zion, which is desolate, the foxes walk upon it. You, O Lord, remain forever. You're thrown from generation to generation. Why do you forget us forever and forsake us for so long a time? Turn, you, us, to you, Lord, turn us to you, and we shall be turned. Renew our days as of old. But you have utterly rejected us. You are very wroth against us. So ends the laments. It's ending here with, God, hear us, hear us. You've utterly rejected us. You, you are so mad at us. And the book of Lamentation comes to an end. But throughout this, we're finding them acknowledge 
acknowledging their sin, knowing God is faithful. So even if it's, you know, it's ending here with you've utterly rejected it, you are wroth against us, it isn't that it ends without hope. Right? We can't just take that one at the end and, and see it. So great lessons in here again, lamentations, sowing sins, reaping repercussions. All right? These tragic events that befell them, dearth and death. Dearth is famine, but it doesn't start with a D, so uh, dearth does. Uh, dearth and death. Um, destruction and desolation of Jerusalem and the temple. Uh, the loss of a king and princes, being able to self-govern, was taken from them. From the large whole nation being able to self-govern, to the families being able to self-govern, to yourself being able to self-govern, taken from them because they're become dead or captive. Captivity. Scorn and mockery from their enemy. And alienation from God. To the point where, where are you, God? Are you going to forget us forever? These are the replications, repercussions of sin. And Yes, we may not experience the destruction and desolation of Jerusalem ourselves or a temple, but there are repercussions for sin that happen in our lives. Do we recognize them? Do we just put tape over them like the idiot laid on the dashboard? Or does it bring us to our knees? Does it humble us? What is our reaction? Is it bewildered complaint? Why? Why is this happening? What did I ever do? I don't deserve this. Why? Is it this depression? Or is it recognition of God as a just judge? Confession of sin. Renewal of prayer to God. And patience uh, bearing of discipline. Patient bearing of discipline. Uh, should be a T there. Patient bearing of discipline. Are we able in times of affliction and times of tragic events in life what is our what is our return on that what is our example of what we feel what do we do how do we react uh, in case you're unaware bewildered complaint and depression is not a good place to be depression can lead to repentance as it says in second corinthians that people could be uh, upset with a situation and they can bring them to repentance but repentance is the key in any of these things and then being willing to patiently bear the discipline that's going on because that was what was happening in the situation this is what love sometimes looks like Love can involve reprimanding your child and putting them out of the house. Love can involve handing a bill of divorce to your adulterous spouse with the hope of them coming to repentance and coming back around. Love includes discipline. God continued to love his people and have mercy on them while he had to reprove them. God does not delight in the death of the wicked. God does not delight in having to chastise, but whom the Lord loves, he chastens. You know, it says in one of these laments that he doesn't enjoy bringing this affliction on the people. Truth is, tragedy can lead to dark despair, right? Or to a deep trust in God. And it worked both ways to the people of Israel in those days, and it works both ways to the people today. What are you going to allow? tragedy and affliction to work in your life? Despair or deep in trust? 
All these things are opportunity. I've talked about opportunity a lot, and I will continue to talk about opportunity. It's having that perspective. All these things that befall us are opportunity to grow in a deeper love and trust for the one who is trustable, trustworthy. All of us fall short of being 100% trustworthy, but he never does. Tragedy should lead us to have a deeper trust in God who is good and is doing good all the time. And that is it for today.